Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church here in Longview, Texas. We are all delighted to be worshiping God together this day. Amen? Amen. Whether you are with us in person or with us wherever you may be, we know that this morning we welcome St. Andrew Presbyterian in Shreveport, Louisiana, who will be celebrating communion with us this morning over the internet, and we appreciate y'all worshiping with us. So as I mentioned last week, we are sort of in the process of updating our sound system. So it may sound a little off today, um, and it's because of, like everything, our components are on back order. So we are doing our best, and we are grateful to those who have made it possible to even have some sound today. So Alex, Hunter, thank you very much. Uh, And so please, we ask you to be patient with us. We are trying to get it resolved as quickly as possible, but as you know, Sometimes it just takes a while to get things in the mail these days, but we promise we are working on it. Um, So some exciting things that are happening. Uh, We still have our QR codes uh, for you to check in with us, either here in person or online. You can use those to let us know that you are here. But you'll also notice that if you are in the pews today, that you have our fellowship pads that you can pass to one another if you are comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable using the fellowship pads, that's fine. Continue to use the QR code, but... Both of those things are available to you, and just wanted you to know that. This last week at our session meeting, our session voted and created a plan for how we are going to start with adding elements into worship. As you all know, when the pandemic hit, we had to shorten everything within worship. We had to drop certain elements of worship, and we were going to start slowly adding them back in. And because I am a geek, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to learn about the different elements of worship. So each week, starting next week, we'll begin with adding the children's chat and reinstituting the offering where we pass the plate. Instead of, we, instead of passing by the plate, we will pass the plate. Um, and so when we add these elements, we're going to take a moment to learn a little bit about why we do these things in worship, to look at the theology behind them, the Reformed history behind them. And I promise promise it won't get too boring. I'll do my best. Uh, But that's going to be a part of our worship. And then by the time that September rolls around, by the time we have rally day, we will be back into the full expression of how we worship on Sunday morning. So with all of that, this morning we also had Sunday school on the second Sunday of each month. During the summer, we will have Sunday school for all ages We hope that you will join us in July when we do it. The adults are talking about the gospel of Luke. The younger ones are playing games with the youth group led by Miss Kira over here. And then the itty-bitty ones have nursery available. So that will be the second Sunday in July. Oh, my gosh. One more thing. We have so many things going on. Uh, You'll notice also with the fellowship pads, we have Bibles and hymnals in the pews again. And so thank you to Mission Longview. Uh, This past week, some of our middle schoolers, and again, Ms. Kira and my lovely wife, Lauren, helped with Mission Longview. And one of the projects that they did, one of the group of middle school uh, youngsters came and brought the hymnals and the Bibles back into the pews. So thank you for that. Um, Let's see. Those are all the announcements that I have for this morning. Kira, do you have some announcements? Please make sure that you use the sign up genius and sign your students up for Vacation Bible School. I just want to know how many students we're going to have every day. That link is in a parent email. It's in a VBS specific email. If you need it again, please let me know. 
Uh, but that link will help me keep track of who we're supposed to see and who we're not supposed to see. And if kids come on not all five days, I just want to know that uh, we're keeping track of your kids so they don't get lost. Uh, and because we greatly appreciate them. And I greatly appreciate them. And I want to make sure that we can uh, give each of them attention and make sure that they're helping us to their best ability as well. Uh, and in... I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, I'm sure there will be more things in the future. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Kira. And I'm glad that after uh, being with us for a year now, you have learned one of the most important things about youth ministry. Don't lose the kids. Yeah. Very important. <laughs> All right. So without any other announcements, I have one. we have an announcement. Speaking of the mic, I'm going to use my band director voice. Good morning. How's everyone doing? The prelude this morning is in multiple movements, so I don't want to catch you clapping between movements or raising your bulletin. So we just wanted to let you know that it's, it's uh, in multiple movements, and you know it takes a while to turn the page. So just wanted to let you know that. And, well, a actually, Dr. Lee's going to go like this when he's through. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll be able to see because his back is Thank you, Richard. Are there any other announcements? Very good. Let us take a moment. Let us take a breath. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Dr. Lee, uh, please join me in the call to worship this morning. The word of the Lord is alive and well. 
God's word cannot be silenced. Let all people praise the Lord. This morning, we are called to come to God as we are called every day, to bring ourselves to him, to lay our good, our bad, our happy, our sad, all at his feet. So please join me this morning in a time of confession. All-powerful God, you turn defeat into victory and death into life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Turn us from our ways of sin. Teach us ways of love and forgiveness. Holy Spirit, strengthen us that we may reject evil. And please forgive us for those times when we were not strong enough to resist temptation. Our sins are heavy, Lord. Please lighten these burdens by the power of your forgiveness. Because of the love of God and the sacrifice of his son, we are forgiven and loved so deeply and more than we can ever imagine. Remember that each and every day. Amen.
bow your head in our uh, prayer for illumination, please. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. We may hear with joy what you say to us today through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36, verses 1 through 8, verses 21 through 23 and verses 27 through 31. Hear the word of the Lord. In the fourth year of Jehokamim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write it, all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. Perhaps when the people of Judah, Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, they will each turn from their wicked ways. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I am not allowed to go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting and read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each turn from their wicked ways from the anger and wrath pronounced against the people by the Lord are great. Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything Jeremiah the prophet told him to do. At the Lord's temple, he read the words of the Lord from the scroll. Now we go to verse 21. The king sent Jediah to get the scroll, and Jediah brought it from the room of Elishama, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehuda had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with the scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. Now we go to verses, verse 27. After the king burned the scroll containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. Also, also tell Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is what the Lord says. You burned the scroll and said... Why did you write it on, the, on that that the king of Babylon would certainly come and destroy this land and wipe it from both man and beast? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one sit to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat by day and the frost by night. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring on them and those living in Jerusalem, the people of Judah, every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we began this series on Jeremiah a few weeks ago with a quote from Walter Brueggemann. Brueggemann says that the book of Jeremiah dares to imagine that God is doing something good in the midst of the pain. The book of Jeremiah we talked about talks a lot about pain, loss, trauma. 
And Jeremiah is the prophetic voice to the pain and the loss and the trauma that the people are experiencing. We talked about how this pain, loss, and trauma first started coming from external forces, from the Assyrian Empire, and then from the Babylonians who followed them. When the Babylonians started to exude military and economic power upon the people of Israel, it culminated in the Babylonians overtaking the capital city of Jerusalem and destroying the temple in Jerusalem. The people experienced pain, loss, and trauma. They lost their capital city. They lost the temple where they came to worship God. They lost the line of Davidic kings. It was a very painful and traumatic time for the people. And again, it was Jeremiah, the prophet, who gave voice to this pain. We began with the call of Jeremiah a few weeks ago, if you remember that. And then from there, we moved on to Jeremiah's temple sermon. Well, when we look at the book of Jeremiah, we see that the pain and the loss and the trauma that is being spoken to and about begins with these external forces and focuses later on the more internal aspects of what's happening with the people of God. So remember that temple sermon? Anybody remember the temple sermon? Chapter 7? Just nod and say, okay, make me happy. All right, good. I feel so much better now. So in the temple sermon, if you recall, which I'm sure you do, Jeremiah is called to speak to the people in the temple. The people in the temple. These are not Babylonians or Assyrians that he is speaking to. He is speaking to God's people, the Israelites, the people of the kingdom of Judah. Those are the people to whom Jeremiah is speaking. Internal. Jeremiah starts to become more concerned with the insiders than the outsiders. And the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah to be spoken to those insiders at the temple that day was that they needed to change their ways. They needed to amend their evil ways so that God could dwell with them. Last week we talked about what R.E. Clements refers to as a prophetic parable. Uh, Y'all may remember the Plato from last week. Again, just nod your head and make me feel better. So God took Jeremiah to the potter's house and showed Jeremiah a potter working at the wheel. But the clay the potter was working was spoiled, and it had to be destroyed and start over again with a new creation. This was a symbol, a sign to Jeremiah of God's power over the people, but not just the people of Israel, but over all nations, all kingdoms, and all peoples. God has the power to destroy and to create. And again, there's a call from the Lord through Jeremiah to the people to change their evil ways. Because if you are in the evil ways, then destruction is what waits ahead of you. And that is not what God wants. Are you starting to see a theme here in Jeremiah? God continues that theme today. The word of the Lord comes through Jeremiah to the people, to the insiders. The word of the Lord is not concerned with the outsiders, the external forces being brought upon the people, but the word of the Lord is concerned with the internal forces with the actions of the people of God, the people as individuals and the people as a whole. It is that internal focus that now the word of the Lord has shifted to talk about. So in this passage, we are told that there's a scroll, right? There's a scroll, and on this scroll is recorded all the words of the prophecies of Jeremiah. It's like a culmination of everything Jeremiah has spoken, that Jeremiah has prophesied, that Jeremiah has spoken from the Lord on behalf of the people. So Jeremiah calls his scribe, or uh, his secretary, his recorder, get with me on this, the person who writes down what he tells them to write down. This guy's name is Baruch, and he calls to Baruch and has Baruch to write down 
everything that the Lord has told Jeremiah to speak from the time of King Josiah. Now, I know you all know with perfect memory the lineage of the kings of Judah, but just in case you don't know, King Josiah was the king of Jehoiakim, who is the king now. I mean, King Josiah was the father of King Jehoiakim. There had been another king in between them that Josiah was also the father of, but it's been about 30 years since Jeremiah began his prophecies and his ministries in Judah. So this scroll is the culmination of about 30 years of prophecies from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah has Baruch write these prophecies on a scroll and then take them to the temple on a fast day to read the words of the scroll to the people. Now it was a fast day, which meant that there was a high likelihood that there was going to be more people at the temple that day, right? So there's a high likelihood that more people would hear the words of the scroll, the words of prophecy for the last 30 years that Jeremiah has been saying to the people. You remember what Jeremiah has been saying to the people? Change your evil ways. These are words of indictment that Baruch reads to the people at the temple that day. These are words of challenge to the people. Words saying that you have done and participated in things that have caused injustice. These are words that challenge the city and the position of privilege that these people inhabit. These are words that will probably make them uncomfortable because they are words that tell them the way you are living needs to change because the way you are living promotes injustice among God's people. So eventually, after Baruch reads these words to the people at the temple, eventually the scroll wanders around and makes its way to the king. And then the king reads the scroll, the prophecies of Jeremiah that have come from his mouth for the past 30 years. Now, the journey of the scroll from the temple to the king is actually pretty funny. So when you get a, t a chance, because I know you all love funny, geeky stuff about the Bible, when you get a chance, read verses 9 through 20 that we skipped over this morning. And David is very grateful that we skipped over them because there's a lot of names in verses 9 through 20. When you get a chance, again, not during worship, please read through verses 9 through 20 because the way the scroll gets from the temple to the king it's really pretty funny. It's got a lot of comedic, bureaucratic rigmarole that the scroll has to go through to get to the king. But just before the scroll makes it to the king, one of the king's aides says to Baruch, Go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. This means that all the people know the king is not going to like what's on the scroll. Go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. They know it will not be good when the king reads the scroll. Uh, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, um, my parents went out of town one week. Uh, and I recognize that I'm telling the story of my parents are at my home church participating with us. I'm sorry. Um, but they went out of town one weekend, and I think it was for a weekend. And when they were coming back, my sister, my brother, and I did some mad dash, furious cleaning of the house. Because we knew the house needed to be spotless when they got home. Because if it was spotless when they got home, then they would know that we hadn't done anything we weren't supposed to do. And they would be in a great mood when they got home, and all would be wonderful. It's a good plan. And it worked. They got home, the house was spotless, and everyone was happy. Until we couldn't find the remote control to the TV. <laughs> then things got bad. Had we known what would happen when the remote control like that was lost, we would have followed the words of Scripture. We would have gone and hid ourselves 
and we would have let no one know where we were. That's the advice given to Baruch before the scroll comes to the king. So the scroll comes to the king, and everyone is expecting the king to blow his top. But he doesn't. It's all very calm. As the words of the scroll are written, are read to the king, every once in a while the king takes the scroll, takes his pen knife or something maybe like this, and cuts off a section of the scroll, takes that section, and places it in a brazier which is like a small portable heater, a tray filled with coals, and watch as that section of the scroll burned. Whoever was reading would read more to the king, and again, he would take that knife and cut it off and put it in the coals and watch it burn. Slowly, meticulously, tediously, the king cut and destroyed the words of the Lord and watched them burn. This is not a response of anger. This is a response of contempt, as one commentator describes it. The king shows contempt for the word of the Lord, for the prophetic voice, and ignores it and watches it burn before his eyes. Willing the words of the Lord to go away. That's what happens when the scroll makes its way to the king. It begins on a journey that's filled with humor and comedy and ends in a scene of contempt. So, what the king does gets back to Jeremiah. And God says to Jeremiah, Do it again. Write the words of the scroll again. But this time, the Lord has an extra message to put at the end for the king. Here are the words that were added. And concerning King Jehoiakim of Judah, you shall say, Thus says the Lord, You have dared to burn this scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land? And will cut off from it human beings and animals. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning King Jehoiakim of Judah. He shall have no one to sit upon the throne of David. And his dead body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring on them and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and on the people of Judah all the disasters with which I have threatened them. But they would not listen. That, my friends, is a rather serious epilogue. Now, historians like to debate about how Jehoiakim actually died, but no matter who is right, it is not a pretty picture. So this tells us a couple of things. It tells us that the word of the Lord cannot be destroyed. The word of the Lord will persist no matter what. It also tells us that if you, like Jehoiakim, ignore the prophetic voice, you do so at great serious danger King Jehoiakim ignored the prophetic voice and did so at grave risk. Perhaps that is a message for us today. When we ignore the prophetic voice, we do so at grave danger and great risk. But there are so many voices in our world and in our society, it's hard to know which are the prophetic voices. 
Well, if we look at the scriptures, particularly maybe in Jeremiah, the prophetic voice has to do with action. The prophetic voice has to do with those whose actions help to promote or participate in some sort of injustice. Those whose actions do not correct the injustices of the world. The prophetic voice has to do with those things that are wrong in society, and we as God's people are supposed to act in order to change. If you don't know what the prophetic voice sounds like, perhaps it is that voice that when you hear it, it makes you feel so uncomfortable. You would rather take it and burn it and throw it away. Perhaps it is when we say things like, I don't know why they're making such a big deal out of that. It's never been a problem for me. Perhaps it is when we say things like, I really don't want to hear any more about what they have to say because it's just going to make me feel guilty. Perhaps when we ignore the prophetic voice, we ignore things that cause injustice. We ignore things that cause problems for our sisters, our brothers, and our siblings in Christ. Perhaps that is what it looks like when we ignore the prophetic voice. But if we ignore the prophetic voice, the word of the Lord in our midst, we do so at great personal danger. Amen. We affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, hear our prayers this day. We lift up to you those who are in pain and those who are suffering. We lift up to you those who are struggling with physical ailments and illness. We lift up to you all of those who need healing, Lord. We are aware that our lives are getting back to whatever normal may be. But we are also aware that there are still those in this world who are struggling with this pandemic and this illness. And we ask, Lord, for your healing powers to be at work, that not only are you healing, but that you are at work in the hands of those who provide care. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask that your spirit of strength and support and love is with all of those who are grieving 
the loss of loved ones. We ask, Lord, that your spirit of wholeness is at work in families and communities that are living in brokenness. We ask, Lord, that you open our eyes and our ears to what is happening in the world around us. That we can see the places where you need us to be at work. That we can listen to the voices that are uttering your words to us. Lord, open our eyes and our ears and quicken our feet and our hands that we may get to work on your behalf. Lord, hear our prayers. And may your guidance, Holy Spirit, not only be with us in our actions, but also with all of those who lead, whether it is this state, this nation, or the countries of the whole world, Lord. We ask that you bless them and guide them to a tomorrow of your making and of your design. In your holy name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. As we come to the table this day, um, we are reminded that this table is much more than a communion table at First Presbyterian Church in Long Beach. Even though we are coming out of the pandemic, we are still using our uh, cups. Uh, that are kind of pre-packaged communion cups. If you do not have one, uh, please let us know. Apparently, I don't have one. I still need one. <laughs> Sometimes we forget things. If you don't have one, put your hand up. We'll make sure and get one to you. Um, these are the cups that you will know have kind of two parts to them. They've got the bread or the wafer on one side, and then the juice or the drink on the other side. And when it comes time for communion, we will all take the body of Christ together. We will all drink of the cup of salvation together as well as a reminder that when we come to this table, we come as one people. Not just the folks at First Presbyterian Church in Longview, not just the folks at St. Andrew Presbyterian Church in Shreveport, or the folks wherever you may be. We are all God's people, and to the table of the Lord, all of God's people are called. Scripture tells us that one day people will come from east and west and north and south and together we will feast at the table of the Lord. My friends, my sisters, my brothers, my siblings in Christ, this is a foretaste of that feast to which you are all invited. Please join me in prayer. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our praise. Holy God, it is right to give you our thanks and praise. We thank you that we can come together. We thank you for blessed fellowship, which has been neglected for too long. We thank you, Lord, for showing us new ways to live as your people. Lord, this is what you have always done. You have always guided us when we go into new places. You have always guided your people when we didn't know what exactly would be ahead. You have always guided and provided for your people when they wandered and felt lost as you provided sustenance from heaven with manna every day, we give you thanks, Lord, that we are provided for every day by you. Teach us to trust in your provision and free us from anxiety. Lord, we give you thanks that when we gather at this table, we gather with you. You who are our risen Lord, you who came and walked and ate and drank and lived with us, you are here with us and we give you thanks. We give thanks that you know what it is like to be human. 
We give thanks that you know what food and drink feel like on the lips. We give thanks that you know what it is like to be hungry. We give thanks that you know what it is like to provide for those who are hungry. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks. Holy Spirit, we praise you and thank you that by your power we can gather here. We can gather with all the saints who have come before us, all the saints who will come after us. Spirit, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that by your power we are lifted into the presence of our risen Lord. We give you thanks that by your power every day items of bread and juice for a moment means so much more. Spirit, we give you thanks that we are nourished and strengthened by your word and by your power. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray in our hearts the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We are told that on the night he was betrayed, our Lord was at table with his disciples, with his followers, with his friends. And while he was with them, he took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it and said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For truly, I tell you, my sisters and my brothers, as often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink this cup, we proclaim the salvation of our risen Lord until he comes again. This is the food of God for the children of God. body of Christ. The cup of salvation.
If everyone is in bed, let people say amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we have been fed this day by you. By the power of your spirit, we have been nourished in body and in soul. And may we be strengthened by the power of your spirit to go out into the world and proclaim your great good news and your gospel of mercy and love. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.